Hey, it is great to see you. I'm going to encourage you to take your Bibles, your Bible apps, and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 24, whether you're uh, here in the room or at home joining us online. Uh, Luke 24 is our text today. If you're in the room and you don't have a Bible, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you, turn to page 1051, and you will find Luke chapter 24, be able to follow along. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible, take one of those with you when you leave. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. And if you're watching online and you don't have access to a Bible and you want one, contact us. We'll get one to you. Uh, we'll mail it to you. If you live in Hawaii, I'll deliver it personally. Uh, and uh, that's just because I'm, I'm, I really want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God. And uh, I'm willing to go to that length of sacrifice for that. Just make sure it's after uh, the end of July so that uh, I don't have to quarantine when I get there. But uh, how many of you like surprises? I see your hands. Now, now, you guys didn't even ask what kind of surprises. There's a lot of you that just, I, I like surprises. Uh, see, I would think that it depends on the surprise, right? So if you win the lottery, yay, right? I'm, I'm all for that because I know you're going to tithe 20% to Calvary. It's all good. Some of you are saying, I don't even play the lottery. That's okay. God doesn't need you to play for you to win. That's my theory, and I'm, I'm staying with it. Uh, on the other hand, there are some surprises that are not yay. Like the one I got this morning, uh, I got up and uh, had a note saying that uh, Pastor Chet and his wife were sick, uh, not going to be able to be at the 8 o'clock service. And, uh, and then given our, our condition of the world, uh, that's why I wasn't out greeting everybody beforehand because I was hanging out with him. And, uh, and if he's sick, and I don't know what he's sick with, I just needed to stay away from people so I won't be able to see you after the service either. Uh, in fact, because he's sick, I'm just going to like, all right, all the staff is going down to Parker tomorrow. We're going to get tested uh, for COVID just so uh, I want you to know, I want everyone to know that we're going to take care of our health so that we can take care of you. Uh, and, uh, but those are not good surprises. In fact, none of us appreciated the surprise of the COVID spring, did we? I mean, stay at home, lose your job, uh, fear everywhere. So uh, let me just, let's do the surprise thing this way. And, and I want you to pay attention to how your loved ones, family, friends vote on this because you need to know what they're thinking and what they're feeling so that you can have a healthy family and friendship. How many of you would love it if your family or friends threw you a surprise party? Okay, see the hands going up? All right, pay attention to the people that you know and came with that uh, there is. Now, on the other hand, how many of you would absolutely despise it if, someone, if your family and friends threw a surprise party? Keep them up so your friends can see. All right, husbands, pay attention. Wives, pay attention. We want healthy, happy marriages in this church. So, and at home, you guys got to get honest about it too. Ask that question because just because you want a surprise party doesn't mean the person you're married to wants a surprise party. See, a few years ago, uh, when my wife Meralda was turning 50, I decided I was going to surprise her. And uh, it's not because I'm a thoughtful, romantic husband, okay? Just don't, that's not, it's because I failed when she turned 40, okay? And I felt like I needed to redeem it. So uh, I thought, she wants to go on an Alaskan cruise. I'm going to plan an Alaskan cruise. And so I got together with some friends that were also turning 50, and we planned this group thing. I bought the, I booked the cruise, bought the plane tickets. I went to her work and talked to her boss about giving her time off she didn't know about. And, and so I put it all together, and then I had to wait for the perfect moment to surprise her. Hold that thought for a minute. So today we're wrapping up the impossible series. We've been looking at the miracles of Jesus, the, the impossible things he did to change people's lives, heal people, raise people from the dead, cast out demons, feed people, you know, all that stuff. And today we're going to be looking at the greatest miracle ever. Uh, but I want you to know that God loves to surprise his people. Okay, God loves surprising his people. If you are a Jesus people, if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, if you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then I want you to know that God delights in surprising you. I know this from Scripture. By the way, I encourage you to read Scripture. I encourage you to read the Bible. It's got great stories in it. You'll learn a lot about God. But one of the things we learn is that God loves to surprise His people because when you read the Bible, you find stories of how God surprised person after person after person along the way. For instance, in the Old Testament, there's this guy named Moses. You guys probably heard of him. 
If you haven't, his story is in the book of Exodus. And uh, God surprised Moses and said, I want you to lead my children, the Israelites, out of slavery in Egypt. And, and so Moses went to do that. God surprised everybody with a bunch of plagues uh, that uh, eventually Pharaoh said, get them out of here. And Moses took them out. But then Pharaoh changed his mind, sent his army after them. And the Israelites were trapped between the Red Sea and the Egyptian army that was going to shred them like paper. And then God surprised them. And what did he do? He parted the Red Sea. The Israelites walked across on dry ground. The, Isra the Egyptian army followed and were drowned. That's amazing. That's a surprise. God loves to surprise his people. Or how about this kid named David? Maybe you've heard of him uh, called King David. Big deal in the Old Testament. Second, uh, First Samuel uh, is where you want to read his story. And, um, and David was just a shepherd boy who would eventually become king. But he got famous when he showed up at this battle. He wasn't even there to fight. He was there to bring supplies to his brothers. He was too young to be considered a warrior. So he's probably like 17 to 20 age range. And, uh, and, and the Philistines had this champion, this professional warrior named Goliath, who was giant in size. And David took him on and David killed him, surprise. And now every time there's a, you know, athletic contest where one is heavily favored, they reference David and Goliath. There was actually a David and a Goliath and it actually happened. Or how about this young Jewish girl living in an obscure Galilean village called Nazareth. One day an angel shows up and he says to her, Mary, you're going to be the mother of Messiah. She says, how can this be? I'm a virgin. I've never even known a man. And he says, the Holy Spirit is going to uh, overshadow you and you're going to give birth to the Son of God. God loves to surprise his people. He's always doing it. And, and I want you to know that the resurrection of Jesus is God's best surprise ever. Luke chapter 24, I'm gonna read the first eight verses. A lot of you are familiar with this. A lot of you are like, I thought we only could study this at Easter. No, it's, it's uh, relevant every day of the year. So uh, here's what Luke writes. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb. Now, uh, let me just pause right there. They is the women who watched Jesus die on Friday. Uh, and then Saturday was the Sabbath. They couldn't go anywhere. On Sunday morning, they went to anoint the body of Jesus, give him a decent burial is what they were doing. It was uh, Mary Magdalene. It was Mary, the mother of Jesus. It was some other ladies with them. So they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And then they remembered his words. I mean, this is a story that is dripping with surprise. I mean, from the stone being rolled away, the empty tomb, the angels showing up, the pronouncement, all of that was a surprise. I mean, they were broken. They were hurting. They were grieving. Surprise, Jesus is alive. They thought they were defeated, but God claimed the victory. They believed their lives were completely shattered, but they were actually changed for the better. They had given up hope, and with good cause, right? Because they watched Jesus die. They saw where he was buried. They knew that the, the one that they had hoped would be the Messiah, that all of it had ended, the movement that they had followed for three years was over. They had lost all hope, and suddenly their lives are filled with joy and celebration. That is an amazing surprise. The resurrection of, of Jesus is God's best surprise ever. But I got to tell you, we don't always appreciate God's surprises. We really don't always appreciate. Now, let me, let me rephrase that. We don't, we don't mind the surprise of God. We just don't like the process getting there. Okay, we don't like the journey getting there. We don't like the experience getting there uh, to get to the surprise. Look at the disciples. Look at the women. I mean, they were horrified when Jesus was betrayed and arrested and condemned and crucified. I mean, this, this is a gut-wrenching, painful, heartbreaking journey. But God was preparing them for the best surprise ever. Hey, let's go back to Morella's story just for a minute. 
Okay, I got the, the trip booked, planned, got the friends going with us, got all of it going. Now I had to plan the reveal. And our friends, thankfully, convinced me to do it sooner rather than later. Because I'm a guy, I'm a dork. I was like, yeah, the night before we leave, that would be perfect timing. My, uh, my friends were like, no, she needs to shop. She needs to plan. She needs to pack. Uh, and so I was like, oh, okay. Plus, they wanted to do it sooner rather than later because uh, they were avoiding us because they were afraid they'd spill the beans. So uh, it was kind of like, <laughs> my, my, my wife actually said, do our friends not like us anymore? I was like, uh, we got a party with them. So we planned this, this dinner party to be the reveal, February 15th. You guys know what February 14th is, right? So it's not just Arizona's birthday, okay? It's, uh, it's, it's Valentine's Day. So I didn't do anything special for Valentine's Day. Yeah, I'm that guy. Uh, sorry. And uh, I got her a card. All right, we've been married a long time. I thought that was enough. But it was an intentional, look, it was an intentional fail, you know, because I knew it was coming. So uh, the day after Valentine's, the day that the reveal is planned for, we go to lunch. And at lunch, she starts sharing with me how hurt she was, how disappointed she was. And Valentine's Day, she just didn't feel valued and loved. And, 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 and she is on the verge of tears. And I'm trying not to laugh. Okay, I confess that to you. I am trying not to laugh. And she's just pouring out her heart. And I'm like, stab yourself at the fork, you know, so you don't crack up. And because uh, I knew what was coming. And a few hours later, we're at the dinner party and the reveal is made. And yes, there are tears again, but now they're tears of joy. You go, nice story, what's the point? Today, your life may not be where you had hoped it would be. You may be broken, you may be hurting, you may be grieving, you might be recovering. You may be alone or afraid or addicted or unemployed and just feeling hopeless. And I want you to understand if you are a follower of Jesus, you are on your way to a surprise. You, you may not be enjoying the journey right now, but God wants to redeem your life. God wants to change your life. That's the promise of the resurrection. See, no matter how broken life appears, God will redeem. He, he's made that a reality in Jesus. He's made that a reality in our salvation, but he's doing it in your life right now. The, a surprise is coming. So I want you to know today that God wants to surprise you. It, this is not like a theory for the group, like God's gonna surprise us or he's gonna surprise them and them, but not me. No, God wants to surprise you. It's personal. That, that's his plan. That's his desire. Your father who loves you enough to send Jesus into this world to suffer and die for your sin, so that you could be part of his family, wants to surprise you. Let me just share with, with you some of the things that God wants to surprise you with, wants to surprise all of us with. For instance, God wants to surprise you with love, not anger. Love, not anger. The Apostle John, you know, who was there that day, said this, 1 John chapter 4, he said, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. See, God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we're sinners, Christ died for us. See, God loves you. He is not angry at you. And that's hard for some of you to hear because you either grew up in a church that was really angry and talking about judgment and condemnation and with a smile on their face, or uh, maybe you had a dad who was just mean and angry all the time and you kind of equated that to God. Look, God is not angry at you. Even if your life is a total mess, God is not angry at you. Even if you are living in rebellion and being defiant, God is not angry at you. God loves you like crazy. Um, you see, what, what the reality is, God grieves your pain. He hurts because you are being self-destructive in your choices, and so he's hurting with you. It's kind of like this. How many parents are there in the room? At home too. How many parents? Okay. How many parents have ever watched their kids do something stupid? We don't have time for the stories right now, but by the way, if, if you've never seen your kids do something stupid, I'd like to meet your children. Uh, so, but here's the thing. Parents, when we watch our kids do something that hurts them, we get, we get angry at the unnecessary pain 
that they are causing themselves. We don't get angry at our kids. We grieve for our children. Our hearts are broken for our kids. And that's how God is towards us. Look, he loves you and he's grieving you if you're living in rebellion, if you're living in pain. He grieves your self-destructive choices because he wants better for you. He wants you to live in blessing. He, he wants you to know that you're loved by him. He wants you to experience that love and, and he wants to fill your life with it. But you gotta be surprised by his love and live in his love to, to get there. So today, I, I hope you're surprised by God's love for you. And God wants to surprise you with mercy, not judgment. Mercy, not judgment. I, I know this may be a shock, but God really doesn't want to condemn you. In fact, God doesn't want to condemn anyone. The Apostle Peter tells us this in the second letter. He says, look, God desires that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I, I mean, that's pretty... Clear statement, God does not desire to condemn you. And, and again, a lot of us grew up in churches where condemnation was, was offered up, you know, in mass and wholesale. Here it is for everybody. You're supposed to be condemned. You're going to get, you know, God's going to send you to hell if you don't do this or do that. Lightning bolts are going to drop from heaven. But that's not God. God wants you to know mercy. He wants to surprise you with mercy. Jesus told us this. Now, most of you are familiar with John 3.16. It's kind of a, a big deal verse in Christendom. Uh, and, and when you hear it, you'll know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, those are the words of Jesus. And we all know that. We go, yay, it's a great truth. If you trust Jesus, you're going to heaven. But do you know John 3:17, the, the verse right after that? Most of us don't. Jesus continues. He says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. God did not send Jesus into this world to condemn the world, but so that the world could know mercy and grace and salvation. And, and, and we need to hear that because a lot of us don't believe it. A lot of us live in guilt. A lot of us live in shame. A lot of us carry that around with us, trying to hide it and trying to, you know, suffer with it, thinking that that's what God wants for us. But God wants you to know forgiveness. Amen. He wants you to live completely free of that guilt. God's not the God of guilt. That's Satan amplifying your mistakes in your ear. That's the voice of accusation. See, God wants you to know mercy. And you go, yeah, but Chad, you don't understand. I've sinned so many times in the same exact way. And I've asked God to forgive me. And then I go back and I do it again. And I promise I'll never do it again. And I do it again. Hey, your capacity to sin does not exceed God's capacity to forgive. Amen. Okay? It just... It is something that is life-changing when you know that. And, and all you have to do is ask. That's the amazing, it's crazy, it, but it's true. The Apostle John said, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and God is righteous and he will forgive our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. All of it. Your past stupidity and your future rebellion as well. See, that's the reality of mercy. And God wants to surprise you with mercy. I want you to know mercy because if you get this, it'll change the way you live. It'll change the way that you celebrate. It'll change the way you relate to other people. And all you gotta do is ask for it. So today, I hope you are amazed by God's mercy and surprised by it. And not only does God wanna surprise you with love and with mercy, but God wants to surprise you with freedom, not rules. Freedom, not rules. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Now, we hear that and we go, okay, yeah, that's nice. Because most of us don't associate religion or church or God with freedom. We think about rules, right? We only think about rules. After all, there are the Ten Commandments. And by the way, God gave the Ten Commandments, but he gave them to us to protect us from our own self-destructive urges. Because... We're idiots and we'll just like hurt ourselves. And God's like, no, here's the boundaries. Here's the guidelines. Don't go past this and you won't crash. But uh, for the record, that's, that's the reality of God's rules. But we all understand that churches a lot of times and religious people a lot of times, they love rules. They love rules. They have rules because they want to control people's behavior because this is what a good Christian looks like and we want you all to look like that whether you are or not. 
And so they put these rules on us, and, and there's a lot of don't do this, don't do that, don't go here, can't do that. We label things as evil and then judge people who go anywhere near it. And, and I don't know about you, I grew up in that environment. Uh, it's probably why I'm such a good rule breaker. But I grew up in that environment, and uh, that, that's not God. But you know what I noticed during the pandemic? Religious people are not the only ones who like rules. Do you guys notice that too? Suddenly, anybody with authority is like, okay, you can't go here. You have to stay home. You got to wear this. You can't do this. It just like, look, people with authority like rules because they want to control behavior. Whether they're religious or secular doesn't matter. That's not God. That is not God. Jesus said the Ten Commandments and all the hundreds of other commandments of the Old Testament are summarized in two statements. Two statements. You can read them in Mark 13 or Matthew 22. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says all the law and the prophets hang on these two. They're summarized in these two. They're dependent on these two. This is what it is. This is what it's all about. So uh, Jesus wants to set you free. He wants you to be free to live, to love, to serve, to bless. He wants you to be free from addiction, from despair, from fear, from greed, from hopelessness, even from boredom. Do you realize that God gave us a purpose and wants us to live on purpose for a purpose? Here at Calvary, we, we summarize it this way, that we exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's what we want people to experience. So I pray that God's freedom is a delightful surprise for you. Because ultimately, God wants to surprise you with new life. New life. A life that begins as we commit to follow Jesus. A life that is possible because of an impossible surprise that we call the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, so today, are you living in the expectation of being surprised by God? Because when you start looking for the surprises of God in your life, surprises to bless you, it changes your attitude and it changes your outlook about the world. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I want to talk to you just for a moment, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in the room. If you're a follower of Jesus, um, look, can we just agree the world's kind of crazy right now? In, in a lot of ways, it's frustrating. Maybe you're feeling angry about stuff. Maybe you're, you're anxious about things. There's a lot of fear out there, a lot of fear in here. Uh, look, the world seems like it's out of control. And, and if you're like me and you watch the news, or you read the news, you, you know, sometimes your blood pressure goes up. Sometimes you just get really frustrated and angry about stuff. And here's the thing. We can't control any of those things. We're not the mayor. We're not the governor. We're not the president. We don't have the ability to tell people what to do or what not to do, even though we want to, right? But you know what we can do? We can trust Jesus. Amen. We can trust Jesus. So when you're feeling frustrated, when you're looking out, when you're feeling anxious, come back to this point where you say, okay, God, I trust you with my life. I trust you with my tomorrow. I trust you with, with all of it. And by the way, God, I trust you with our nation because it seems out of control. But you know what? You're going to surprise us with blessings because you're, you're for us. You're going to surprise us in ways that redeem that we don't see coming. And we got to look for that. Because if you look for the bad, if you're just like you're, you're waiting for the other shoe to drop and you're anticipating the, the bad stuff that's going to go on next, what's going to happen next, I'm afraid to ask that question, you're going to get depressed and you're going to get fearful and you're going to stop living as that powerful, free child of God. I want you to live free. So that means you come back to Jesus. You say, Good, Jesus, I'm going to trust you. Because Jesus in his death and resurrection defeated sin, which means that you are forgiven. He defeated death, which means you don't have to be afraid about what comes next even if you get sick. And he defeated hell, which means that your destiny is changed from eternal torment to eternal life. And nothing can take that away from you if Jesus is your savior. So we can live differently. We can live as those children of God with faith, with courage, with joy, if we'll bring it back to Jesus and hold on to him.
Now, if you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, or if you're watching online and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, then today I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to plead with you. Make that commitment to Christ today. Surrender to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I need you. I need you to forgive me. I want that mercy that he's talking about. And God's love will pour into your life and he will change your life. If you're online, click the button that says, yes, I follow Jesus. But do more than that. Uh, ask for a prayer and let the online host talk with you and, and connect with you because we want to follow up. We want to have a conversation with you this week, whether it's uh, online or in person. And, and if you're here, Please talk to one of our prayer team members after the service. They would love to talk with you and pray with you about what it means to follow Jesus. Or fill out a connect card and drop it in the offering box and just say, hey, today I trusted Christ and we will get with you this week. We want you to know the freedom and the life and the love that we have in Jesus. Uh, one more thing, if you're a follower and you know it, but you've never told anybody about it, you've never publicly declared your faith in baptism, Pastor Joe already told you, next Sunday, 6 o'clock, London Bridge Beach, we would love to include you in your act of declaring to the world that Jesus has changed your life. We want to celebrate with you. Let us know, and we'll plan it. Will you pray with me? Father, we are broken people, and this world is broken and messed up right now, and we just come to you asking for grace, knowing that you want to give it, asking that you would uh, heal lives, heal our nation, heal this world. But knowing that ultimately you've already done that because you took our sin, our brokenness, our hurt, our failure on the cross and you paid for us to be redeemed. So God, today we want to know that. We want to live in that. We want to live in the victory of Jesus. We want to live in the love of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus, the freedom of Jesus. And we need you to communicate that to us. So meet us in this place, whether this place is the Sweetwater campus or it's in the homes all across the city or the nation or the world and communicate to us the reality of Jesus and his gifts. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.